Indian Point nuclear power plant on the banks of the Hudson River, about 40 miles north of New York City. Hi, I'm Paula Zahn. The earthquake and tsunami that crippled the nuclear reactors in Japan have a lot of people wondering if the same thing could happen here at home. Tonight, we'll take you behind the scenes in Fukushima, Japan, for the dramatic and ongoing struggle to bring that plant under control and prevent a nuclear nightmare. At the Fukushima nuclear power plant on the east coast of Japan, American software consultant Chris Hope pours himself a fresh cup of coffee. After 21 days in Japan, he's looking forward to getting back home to Idaho. It's a run-of-the-mill day at the plant. Three of the six reactors at the massive complex are shut down for routine maintenance. Units one, two, and three are operating normally. 2.46 p.m. It happens. What do you remember when the quake struck at 2.46 p.m.? What did you feel? What did you see? My shock came when I saw my Japanese co-workers who were pretty bulletproof for these minor quakes. They started diving under desks. And I saw their eyes get real big, and I knew this was not your typical, you know, earthquake. This is the most powerful earthquake to strike Japan in over a 1,000 years. It registers an incredible 9.0 on the Richter scale, unleashing enough energy to power all of the United States for a month. All across Japan, gaping cracks open along fault lines. In Tokyo, the earth shudders violently for five minutes. Office workers scramble for cover as their skyscrapers sway back and forth. The impact is so enormous, the Earth starts to spin faster. For Chris Hope, this will be one of the longest days of his life. But in reality, the earthquake will actually shorten March 11th by 1.8 microseconds. I could feel the sound of the shake in my chest dust and debris were coming down, and so I could taste it and was kind of choking on it a little bit. Uh, the lights went out. You know, time seems to slow down for you, and you kind of think, you know, am I going to die here? What happens if this building falls on me? You know, am I in the best location? And I remember yelling something like, I'm out of here, or let's get out of here. And we ran into the hallway, and of course, it's pitch black. The lights are out. What could you observe from where you were standing about what was going on at the rest of the plant? I saw the outside of the reactor building, and I saw a big crack open up in that. I could hear what sounded like explosions. I could see the big exhaust smokestacks that were swaying back and forth. I thought for sure those were going to fall over. The immediate crisis for workers is the loss of electricity. But engineers designed the plant to withstand destructive quakes, planned for the loss of power. The three reactors in operation automatically go into scram mode, emergency shutdown. Control rods stop the nuclear chain reaction by sliding between the fuel rods. When the earthquake happened, the panels light up, sirens are going, uh, alarms are beeping everywhere to a layman that would scare the devil out of you. Lake Barrett knows what it's like inside a nuclear power plant during a crisis. He directed the containment and cleanup effort at Three Mile Island. Now, these operators are trained for this, so even though it looks like complete chaos and pandemonium, they are at their stations doing what they need to do. I knew how redundant a lot of these plants, they got backup systems on top of their backup systems, and so I, I had no fear. Despite the crack Chris noticed in the thick steel and concrete containment structure, the plan appears to have survived the earthquake. But another destructive force is bearing down on not just the plant, but a vast stretch of Japan's east coast, a giant tsunami. Up the coast from the Fukushima power plant, 
Supporters of the Marine Wildlife Organization Sea Shepherd are in the town of Otsuchi to monitor fishing practices that threaten porpoises. We started to feel the earth shake. We are currently experiencing an earthquake. It was hard to stand up straight in a lot of my video. I'm trying to show the cars rocking back and forth, but I'm also rocking back and forth. My first instinct wasn't to think that there was a tsunami coming. But team leader Scott West knows his group is in a terribly vulnerable spot if a tsunami does hit. You know what? I think we get out of the center harbor. Yeah. Yeah. Scott started shouting, you know, this could be a tsunami, we need to get out of here. It was just kind of mayhem at that point because people were panicking. It was about halfway through our drive to the hill, the tsunami sirens went off. Can you hear the sirens? The group makes it to high ground just before the massive tsunami strikes. It was just a matter of minutes, wasn't mm -hmm. it? It was. Between life and death? It was. The tsunami hits hundreds of miles of coastline with incredible fury. Entire towns are wiped off the map. In a matter of minutes, more than 13,000 are killed. Thousands more go missing. Half a million people lose their homes. The numbers are staggering. From their hilltop perch, Mike and Tara watch helplessly as the tsunami overwhelms the fishing village of Otsuchi. Look, oh in the distance. Oh my god, there is a freaking house floating. This is unreal. Their close-up view makes the experience deeply personal. I wonder if there's a person in that house, and then it struck me. It, there could be, you know, there was a house that was floating by. But I still haven't really processed it because no one teaches you how to deal with that. The swirling ocean water sweeps away the bits and pieces of countless lives. A thriving town is being reduced to little more than a debris field right before their eyes. I was thinking to myself, am I really witnessing a town disappear right now? There's fires everywhere. The whole town is underwater. The tsunami is an unstoppable force and is now closing in on the Fukushima nuclear power plant and Chris Hope. I could hear over the loudspeaker that there was a tsunami warning, a large one. And I looked over and saw the look on these people, terrified. Chris joins roughly 750 workers who flee the plant for higher ground, leaving only essential workers behind. They have no idea of the size of the tsunami to come. What happened once the tsunami hit? It was much larger than it was anticipated. The design basis that the engineers built the plant to could have withstood a wave three houses high. But the actual wave that hit them was four houses high and flooded many of the areas where emergency equipment is located. The 750 workers who fled the plant are now safely on high ground. They are the lucky ones. A few are unaccounted for. And they started taking roll call. And I remember looking over, and uh, one of my coworkers was trying to write our names, and his hand was shaking so badly that he couldn't do it and actually pass it off to, a, to another guy. A huge wall of water swamps the emergency diesel generators and renders them useless. Seawater is flooding electrical systems. These before and after satellite images show the extent of the damage. The ability to manage the crisis is now in serious jeopardy. Once the tsunami took out all the diesel generators and they got an understanding of how immense this natural phenomenon was, I'm sure their adrenaline levels went up a lot. The crisis in the control room becomes more urgent as many control panels are knocked out and telephone service to the outside world is lost. The Fukushima plant one of the world's largest nuclear power stations with the capacity to provide electricity to more than a million homes is now running on batteries. They know all the red lights come on for all the diesel generators. All the red lights never come on for all the diesel generators. And they knew the battery power lasts only so long. 
The batteries are the last line of defense. They are powering the pumps that circulate cool water. Even though the reactors have been shut down, the rods are still at a dangerously high 500 degrees Fahrenheit. If the cooling system shuts down, the rods could overheat and melt down. At 4.36 p.m., control room operators receive terrible news. The cooling system in Unit 1 stops working. The situation is escalating. The government orders an evacuation of people within a two-mile radius of the plant. Everyone within six miles is urged to stay inside. The eyes of the nation and the world are now on the select few inside the plant. It will be up to them to avert a full meltdown and a nuclear nightmare. In Japan, this is the morning after. The destruction from the earthquake and tsunami is appalling. The numbers of dead and missing, heartbreaking. An urgent relief effort is underway, but it's a daunting task. Roads and rails are now twisted ruins. Power and communication lines are down. It's hard to imagine how this part of the world will ever return to normal. The massive Fukushima nuclear power plant that sits on the Pacific coast is now a crippled giant. There is no electricity. Cooling systems have been knocked out. Unit one is overheating. Workers put on radiation suits and masks. They must improvise some solution, but with no power, they are literally working in the dark. Basically, they were dealing with five critical things at once. So it is a very traumatic situation. I mean, the pressure is, is immense on these folks. In the control room, engineers are devising emergency plans even before they can properly assess the damage to the plant. In the small fishing village of Otsuchi, the damage is painfully obvious. There's filled with smoke. Through an eerie haze hanging above the harbor, Tara Millen and her colleagues from Sea Shepherd are overwhelmed by the scene below. There's no emotion that can describe it because you're just standing there in complete shock. How could this happen? As they make their way down the hill, it's clear the only way out will be on foot. Each step takes them closer to the destruction they barely escaped. This is what our road used to be. Last night it was flooding with water. Power poles were down, the power lines were live and on the ground. We didn't know if they had power in them, so we traversed over them carefully. Watch out for the power lines. It was just complete devastation. Like, you know, cars turned over, the tsunami wall was under, under the water. It was a huge wall. It was, you know, this thick. We're currently traversing our way, trying to get out of here. Um, we got past the spot where the road had broken. The road was literally cut in half, and there was, you know, a waterfall going through it, and it was just completely surreal. Just 24 hours before, this thriving waterfront was bustling with activity. Now, it's silent and still. Maybe 1% of the houses were still standing, and uh, the, only, the only house that was standing that I could see is where everybody was sleeping that night. It was strange because we were there earlier in the day, and you look in every direction, there's just absolutely nothing. We hiked all the way up this hill and up and around. Found a community of people. I think this is where they used to live. They were devastated, you could tell, and they were in shock just as much as we 